All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is Left Bank Books welcomes St. Louis author, artist, and historian, Jenny Price, who will discuss her new book, Stop Saving the Planet, an Environmentalist Manifesto. Price will be in conversation with journalist and senior writer for Grist, Nathaniel Johnson. Left Bank Books is St. Louis's oldest independent bookstore. We would like to thank all of our supporters, the supporters of Jenny and Nathaniel, and everyone for their outpouring of love for our bookstore. Left Bank Books offers curbside pickup and delivery to anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. We are happy to be able to bring our event series virtual. We believe that events are a way to expand your mind and bring in new thoughts to make the world a better place. We hope that you enjoy this event, and we hope that you support Left Bank Books by purchasing a signed copy for you or for all of your friends at left-bank.com. And a special treat, because Jenny is local, uh, Jenny will come by and personalize copies for you as well. So if you leave a note in the special order that you would like to have a book personalized to someone, uh, you can have it sent to a friend for uh, any one of several occasions, or you can have it personalized to yourself. Purchasing a copy of the book from Left Bank Books allows us to keep our bookstore and staff operating, and it allows us to keep this event series going. So thank you so much for your support. I am Shane Mullen. I'm the events coordinator for Left Bank Books. I help produce our hundreds of author events each year with a fantastic team here in St. Louis. We will be taking questions from you, the audience, at the end of the event. So you can type your questions as a comment at any point in time throughout the event, and we will get to them at the end. And be sure to follow Left Bank Books on Facebook to be notified about all of our fantastic virtual events. We have many, many incredible events lined up for the year and are adding events daily. About tonight's book, Stop Saving the Planet. We've been saving the planet for decades, and environmental crises just get worse. All this hybrid driving and lead building and carbon trading seems to accomplish little to nothing and low-income communities continue to suffer the worst consequences. Why aren't we cleaning up the toxic messes and rolling back climate change? And why do so many Americans hate environmentalists? Jenny Price says, enough already. With this short, fun, fierce manifesto for an environmentalism that is hugely more effective, a whole lot fairer, and infinitely less righteous. She challenges you, corporate sustainability officers and the EPA, to think and act completely anew and to start right now to ensure a truly habitable future. Carolyn Finney, the author of Black Faces, White Spaces, says, when keeping it real goes right, in this moment of reckoning, Jenny Price calls us out to call us in and does so with humor, insight, and an in-your-face attitude that is informed and dare I say, hopeful, about our capacity to change how we think, see, and do green. And again, a note that Jenny will sign and personalize copies of Stop Saving the Planet. And now about tonight's speakers. Jenny Price is a public writer and artist and a research fellow at the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts at Washington University, St. Louis, here in St. Louis. Nathaniel Johnson, uh, who Jenny will be in conversation with, is a journalist who lives in Berkeley, California with his wife and two daughters. He is the senior writer for Grist and has written two books, All Natural and Unseen City. He's written pieces for a bunch of fancy magazines and radio shows, which have won some awards that sound more important than they really are, but I'll leave that up to you. Without further ado, I am very happy and proud to welcome Nathaniel Johnson and Jenny Price for Left Think Books. If you would please help me in giving them a very warm round of applause. Hello. <laughs> I can't hear the applause from here. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. Yeah, if everyone could just be louder with the applause, that'd be great. <laughs> I'm really excited for tonight for tonight's event. Um, I will leave you to the conversation. So thank you so much for doing this tonight. Thanks. Yeah. What an exciting thing to do. Uh, Jenny has has long been a sort of hero of mine, someone I've, I've looked up to as a writer and an a, a example of, of how to think about the environment. Um, so this is this is fun for me. Um, I think maybe to start out with, we should just 
can you just give us the elevator pitch for, I think people need to understand kind of what the argument is in, in thumbnail. Yeah. And um, I'm a big fan of Nate, so so this, this is great. This is a mutual fan club. And also, I just want to say it's really exciting to be able to do this book launch at Left Bank Books, which is a bookstore I've been shopping at since forever, basically, because I grew up in St. Louis. It's been my bookstore for a long time, so so thank you. Um, okay, so the elevator pitch, I'll try to make it short. Um, basically, the premise is that um, what we're doing isn't working, right? So, um, you know, this is the 52nd Earth Day, and we're like 30 years behind where we should be on climate change. Plastics are a disaster. Forever chemicals are in everyone's drinking water. Um, you know, the sixth extinction is raging on. So all these things that we're doing, recycling, carbon offsets, lead building, Prius driving, um, none of this is, is really working. Um, or at least not doing, you know, nearly as much as we need to be doing. So what should we do instead? Stop saving the planet, right? And what I mean by that is stop thinking about the environment as something that's out there that we have to save and start thinking about environment as in here, right? So if everybody looks around their, their rooms, um, everything you see is made out of environment, right? Our lives are foundationally environmental. We change environments to live. So, and the two most important questions you can actually ask if you're having nightmares about climate change aren't, um, isn't, first and foremost, how do we save an environment as a world out there, the environment as the world out there? It's how do we change environments to create our stuff? And how do we change environments to create our wealth? And I think American environmentalism since the first Earth Day has sort of failed profoundly to, to insist and show us how our lives are foundationally environmental. And in fact, the strategies I think are failing pretty egregiously to really challenge how we change environments to create stuff and wealth. Um, and to, um, to, to, to live, um, really failing to challenge. All those things I just mentioned really don't challenge our industrial and economic practices in any significant way. They're sort of designed to let us keep doing those things while trying to care about the environment. Is that, was that a short enough elevator? Yeah, yeah but I think there's just a couple other points. Like one, I think people would, would hear that and be like, oh, no, no, but I am already on top of this. Like, I recycle, but then you just mentioned recycling as, as not solving the problem. I, I yeah. do, you know, I follow all these checklists. Um, so there is, there is this way that environmentalism is like, here's, here's all these personal things that you can do. Um, yeah. But you, 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 for you, that's, that, that's, that's the wrong direction. Say more about it's, that. It's meaningless. So let, let me, let me answer that, sort of address that with this and that, um, there are three things I don't like about save the planet as the environmentalist mantra, right? Save the planet, okay? So save, I think, has encouraged this kind of, um, you know, green virtue, this greener than thou approach to environmentalism that's like, we all know is kind of super annoying, but also really, really hard to get rid of, where you're really awesome when you save the planet, right? And the planet, which is what Americans like to call the environment, um, so it has encouraged this kind of weird way of thinking where anything you do is effective because anything you do saves this one big planet, this thing called the environment is the world out there, right? So anything you do. So what do you do when you call what I call, I call them green virtue and whole planitude, which I think you cannot understand what environmentalists do and why, unless you understand the seductions of green virtue and whole planitude. And what do you get when you add, you're awesome when you save the planet to anything you do saves the planet, you're awesome when you do anything to save the planet. And I think that you're awesome when you do anything to save the planet pretty much describes most of the do nothing environmental strategies at the individual level, at the corporate level, and at the public level. Like we can just do anything, anywhere, any little bit, it'll all add up, which is crazy. It doesn't all add up. Right, we have to pay attention. It's sort of like a what, when, who, where, why, who cares approach to environmentalism, and it's clearly not working. And it, again, it's just designed to basically avoid the things that we actually have to do. So the um, the personal the personal action things that do take into account that are more in here, like yeah. yes, I'm, I'm I'm recognizing that my life is part of the industry, and I'm I'm you know at least I've gotten over that hurdle. But you're saying the problem with that is it just the math doesn't work. It doesn't. There are these sort of uh, 
they're they're not demonstrably helping anything. Is that is that yeah, right? I mean, I think one of the, if you really want to do something, one of the most important things you can stop doing is stop obsessing about what you can personally do. You know, I have okay. So the book has eleven reasons to stop saving the planet, which is sort of the critique, and then thirty nine ways to stop saving the planet, which are it's basically my response when I would give um, when I would present the material this material to college students. They would say, "Well, what can I do?" So I tried to to, to do that, but. Um, one of the 11 reasons is because to stop saving the planet is because you can't solve the Middle East crisis by yourself. You know, I think it's it, the environment's really the only sort of major global crisis that we assume that you can solve from your kitchen. You know, we don't assume you can solve the Middle East, Middle East crisis or child poverty or the immigration problem, even though your daily decisions are very bound up you know, with those problems. But there's something about like green virtue where, you know, you personally can, can you know, solve climate change from your kitchen and you can't, you can't. So one of the most important things we have to do is stop believing that we can and really work for some big systemic changes. And, and I think farther than that, like it's not just that you're saying it's, it doesn't work. There's, there's actually a problem with this, with this green virtue. Like what's, what's wrong with, um, with people being so proud of themselves for uh, the little things that they're doing to save the planet? Because the little things aren't saving the planet. They're not doing anything. You know, when you change that light bulb, that's, that's not beating back climate change, right? That's sort of like a one plus one equals a hundred kind right. of thing. Right? But what about, I mean, in addition to that, you, you also talk about there's, there's a sort of, there's a problem with, this being a kind of um, a way of demonstrating elitism um, mm -hmm. and and could you can create the situation where people really dislike environmentalists. You can start to understand why uh, people not in the tribe might get mm -hmm. really peeved. Yeah, so, okay, so I'm just gonna cut to the chase since you're really um, leading me there, which is that I think that basically what, and obviously this is this is a polemic, so I'm kind of arm waving and obviously I'm simplifying, but basically what save the planet approach allows for is it allows affluent environmentalists who are the people who contribute the most pollution, who benefit the most from creating emissions and pollution and who suffer the least. It allows affluent Americans in particular to continue to change environments horribly atrociously to create our stuff and wealth, but to think that they're actually doing something about it. And I'm not saying that it's all hypocrisy. I think that there's a lot, I mean, this would actually um, distinguish my book from some other work out there that I actually really admire, say like Naomi Klein, who talks about it, I think is mostly hypocrisy. I think there's actually a lot of good intentions. Um, when people buy a Prius or change their light bulbs or recycle plastic, which is not getting recycled or, you know, do all these things, um, tear down perfectly good houses to build lead, lead platinum certified houses. Um, I think there's a lot of good intentions, but, um, but um, you know, good intentions aren't good enough ultimately. Um, and I think that, that one of the things I'm really trying to do in my book is because a lot of people are making these critiques, right? I'm hardly the first. I mean, a lot of the things I'm saying you can read, um, you know, especially now, I think this critique is really growing. Um, but I think one of the things I really try to do in my book is try to explain why Save the Planet logic and Save the Planet strategies are so powerfully seductive to people and why people are really convinced that they're gonna work, even when you really think about it, they're, they're, they're utter nonsense, most of them. Um, but um, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, really good intentions. There's a lot of fear for people's children and grandchildren. You know, there's a lot of really good things that go into it. So I'm really trying to reach. I'm trying to reach a few different groups. But one of the key ones is kind of well-intentioned environmentalists and trying to say, look, I know you're well-intentioned, but this stuff is actually um, is it, it, we're, we're going backward and we're out of time. We are we are really out of time. We were out of time three years ago. So we can't fool around with this stuff anymore. Does that does that kind of address what you're? Yeah. Getting? Mm -hmm. I um. This is. I, I want to ask you why. Why this book? So this is really this is sort of a funny book in some ways. It's when I'm asked to 
review a book or to, to do something like this, I, you know, I'll be like, okay, send it to me. Oh gosh, now I've got to read this thing. And this is incredibly easy. You know, it's like a hundred pages <laughs> uh -huh. and then there's, and there's another, you know, there's another hundred pages of um, suggestions <laughs> for, for things to actually do in the back. Um, yeah. And it's a hundred pages that just like on, on fire with incandescent, <laughs> you know, fury and also like humor. Um, oh. And so, so why, why a manifesto? Why, what was going on in your life that yeah. made you decide you needed to write this sort of broadside? Right. And I mean, it's partly what's going on in my life and it's partly what's going on in my world, you know, as I just, watch things get worse and worse. So I wrote to, when I sent this to my, um, my, writing, prof uh, my, my writing professor from college, um, I said, gee, I, I'm not sure you're gonna like it. It's a tiny, fun, angry duck of a thing. And he wrote back and he said, tiny, fun, angry duck of a thing is now an official genre aside, you know, like historical, biographical, you know, whatever it is. It's a tiny, I mean, I, I'm really happy that you described it that way because I want it to be it's a really angry book, but I also want it to be fun to read. And I wanted you to be able to read it in an hour, you know, because I feel like everybody should read Naomi Klein's book. This changes everything, capitalism versus climate. Capitalism is also, I don't use the word in my book. Um, we can talk about that. But um, but a lot of people don't read it cover to cover. So I wanted something that people would, would potentially read cover to cover. And I'm also really, really, the audience I care the most about is young people. It's millennials and whatever those generations after them are called. Um, I'm not sure it's your kids, you know, eventually. Uh, Nate, so what was going on in, um, and this book is really different. So everything I've written before, I think we talked about this before, it has been, this is a really different set of strategies. It's a, it, everything I've written before has been sort of a tone like, I've tried to get people to like me, you know, it's like, let's think about this together. I do this too, you know, whatever. And um, and I've just thrown thrown all that out the window this time. And, and the tone of this book is more like, stop it already! Like enough, enough. We've been doing this for how many decades? You know, it's clearly not working. Just stop. So I think part of it is is my life just getting older and having most of my career. I've sort of talked about this idea of nature is out there and how problematic it is and how it shapes our cities in super problematic ways and. So this book is about how it shapes our environmentalist strategies. And I feel like I just can't get through to people. You know, it's like this way of thinking about environment is so, take, it's probably arguably the single most powerful unquestioned assumption that we have, you know, that so many Americans have. And it's so difficult to get through to people. So this time I just thought sledgehammer, like if I can't do it with this book, um, it is beyond my powers as a writer, you know, to do it. So it's just, um, it is an angry book. And I'm also at an age where I, I don't have anything to lose at this point. I'm going to be angry. You know? I can do whatever I want at my age now. Right. So, yeah. I mean, were you, did you find the anger um, off-putting? <laughs> um, I no. shouldn't ask in my book launch, but uh, since I already put it <laughs> So I, have I, to didn't. Listen to I didn't, but there's, I mean, there, there were, um, I found myself wondering if there in parts of it, uh -huh. um, if there were, if you were arguing, uh, against things that, that I thought were actually important. So the, okay. for me, I, I'm, I'm right with you with the, you know, the, this framing of the out there environmentalism versus the environments being us, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, but for me where that, that, I mean, the most powerful thing about that for me is that it, um, if you, if you think of the environment as out there, at least it tends to let people um, condemn industry, bringing them all these things they need to live um, right. while still wanting those things. Mm -hmm. And exactly. And I think the we may diverge a bit in in the the next step I take is like if you're if you're an in here environmentalist then you become a lot more pragmatic and willing to say like okay what are the actual trade offs I can mm -hmm. I need to make you know it's I'm you know I, mm -hmm. I grew up 
in a place where I was, I was the hippie family moving into the, um, the forest that, you know, and we managed to kill off the lumber industry. Right. And, and as I've gotten older, I've, I've thought, well, gosh, you know, but I still, you know, there's wood all over my house. I love wood. This is this beautiful thing. Like, how do we actually cut down trees? Like, what are the trade-offs? You know, what, what can we, how can we do this right? Um, yeah. And I worry that, um, so as I was reading it, there was all this stuff like, you know, stop doing this, stop doing that. And mm -hmm. I, I start to worry that it's like, well, gosh, we can't, we need to start doing things mm -hmm. more than stopping things. You know, how, how do we, yeah. how do we make these marginal improvements on, you know, doing yeah. lumber slightly better this year and then slightly better the next. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, so first of all, everybody should read Nate's book, All Natural, it's really wonderful, um, and Unseen City as well. But um, I mean, I think it's really interesting because I mean, I'm coming from the exact same place and my whole, one of my intentions in talking, about, because you know, a lot of really progressive environmental uh, thinkers who are saying a lot of the same things I am still talk about saving the planet. So my intention in saying we need to talk less about saving, which is an essential part of changing environments wisely, right, and responsibly. But it's not the first question you need to ask. And my intention in shifting that verb from save to change is to have people not shy away from that we have to change environments to live. So I think we're really on the same page here. You know, I'm saying, no, we have to embrace that we change environments and really think about that first. I mean, an ant changes environments to live, a microbe change. I mean, it's the definition of living on earth. And as humans, we have special responsibility because look at you know how drastically we're changing environments. So, um, you know, it's really like, well, don't be afraid of just saying we're going to change environments. It's how you do it, not whether you do it, which I think is, has been a problem in environmental rhetoric. And then I think it's not about marginally better this year. And I think this is maybe a place where we, we really do disagree. It's not about marginally better. It's about like massively better in the next two years, you know? Um, so a lot of my book is about really, really changing what we think is normal, right? Like 2050 is a totally meaningless date. I think 2035 is a totally meaningless date. I think that's the Biden date for electric cars. I think electric cars is a totally ridiculous goal. Um, yeah, yeah. But um, I think I just saw something that Greta Thunberg said where she said, just stop talking about dates. Like what we do in the next three to five years is what's most important. You know, we have to do it now. And um, and I don't think that's impossible. And I don't think, I think the, the trick is to say that what we have now is not, you know, the economy we have now is not normal by any stretch of the imagination. It's a radical, crazy, insane, insanely devastating socially and environmentally econ economy. And we have to stop thinking that that calls for an equitable economy, calls for a sustainable economy, calls for an economy that actually, you know, gives most of us the resources we need to thrive and that works for everyone and doesn't devastate the ecosystems that we need to change to live in. But that's normal, right? That's just common sense. That's not radical change or revolutionary change. You know, that's just normal. Right. But we can we can we can argue about that, I suspect. <laughs> well, I, I mean, is is it fair to say that you're I mean, to, to be just massively reductive about your book, that it's it's just a case for addition and saying we, you know, in a couple of places, here, you just say add it up. You know, we just need to add it up and we're doing correct addition and, and seeing like does you know, this policy actually work. Um, there's been a failure to do that and to mm -hmm. calculate yeah. everything in a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a case against bad addition too. You know, yeah, it's a, it's a what, case yeah. against the logic that something is better than nothing, which is just simply not true. It's a case against the, the logic that if you just do anything, anything you can, it'll all contribute to saving the planet, which is simply not true, right? It's a case against, I mean, I think we need to stop measuring so much. I mean, who the hell cares if, you know, like Portland, I just read, is trying to measure its carbon footprint. Like, just stop. We don't need to measure your carbon footprint. We need to just get you, you know, get you to net zero, right? However you do that. And it's impossible to measure your carbon footprint. Like, stop. That's just not useful. It's not useful to, to be measuring 
um, how fossil fuel emissions go up and down in California now that they have this completely ineffective, well, mostly ineffective climate plan, which is supposed to be the model for the rest of the country, it's not useful to say, oh, look, emissions went down by 5% or 3%. Maybe they went up 20% the next year, but that's, that 3 to 5% is, is meaningless. Like that's not what we need to be doing, 3 to 5%. So, um, you know, you know, go, go back to what Greta Thunberg said, like just stop throwing around numbers and start doing what we actually need to do. Um, you know, it's just, we, we're, it's, we, the scale of the solutions that we're using is so incommensurate to the scale of the problems. And we know that, and we've known that for many decades. And um, it's just time, we're way past time where we can afford to, to keep pretending that, that, that we can use our economy to solve, you know, that maximizes profits and growth instead of our health and well being to solve the problems that an economy that maximizes profits and growth instead of our health and well being creates. And yet, what are the big solutions? It's, it's buy stuff, right? It's green growth, it's carbon trading, it's carbon offsets, it's market solutions. And unless you change the fundamental structure of the markets, market solutions will never, ever, ever, ever work. And even if they do work to, to beat back climate change, we cannot. They're not treating the root causes. We cannot, uh, uh, we cannot go after environmental crises, crisis by crisis, pollutant by pollutant, because you're, if you don't treat the root cause of climate change, which is a completely unsustainable economy and massively unsustainable industrial practices, then it's just whack-a-mole, right? Those solutions are going to create huge existential problems elsewhere. Yeah, I'd say that's... Well, now I'm ranting. Now I'm ranting, but the book is a rant, so hopefully that's okay. <laughs> I get very verklempt. I think that's true, but it's like, it, in some in some senses, that's it's true. That I mean, there's a, there's a lot there, but just to to take the last yeah. point, I mean, Good I rant. think that that history, the history of pollution, is is one of mm -hmm. improvement. Um, you know, you see you see just massive pollution with the industrial revolution. And then you have this, you know, horribly inequitable system playing whack-a-mole, but slowly cleaning up the, like the terrible mm -hmm. um, coal smoke over London, and then slowly cleaning up the, you know, mm -hmm. the Cuyahoga River after it catches fire. And, mm -hmm. you know, getting, we're still a long way from getting all the lead out of the pipes, but, uh, but gosh, we're a lot better than we were when, uh, when, children were eating it off the walls. Um, right. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm just as, uh, just as frustrated by the pace as, as you, but there's, there's at least, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the curve of progress is, is way too slow, but it's at least moving in the right direction. No. Okay, but okay, I'm just gonna rant again, obviously, right? Because I think you're just setting me up to rant, I suspect. <laughs> but I, this before and after environmentalist narrative, sort of heroic environmentalist narrative, at this point just drives me crazy because I think we can't be afford we can't afford to be you know again it's like okay, and I think in fact if you look at the history of American environmentalism, sure you know you can compare the black skies in L.A. in the 1970s to the still the most polluted city in the country, but certainly better. But the problem is that I think what it's mostly done is to make um, pollution more inequitable, right? That what we've mostly done, I, I would argue, is to clean up um, environmental devastation where and when more affluent Americans encounter it and, you know, and, and, not, and then stash it and concentrate it in low-income areas so that almost, you know, to live in an low-income, to be poor in this country is to be sick. You know, it is just to be beset by toxics and landfills and, um, um, you know, poisonous drinking water and poisonous air and everybody has asthma and respiratory problems. And even if uh, the Clean Air Act has made some of those areas somewhat cleaner in some ways, um, and, you know, there's lead in all, there's lead, I was just reading some, there's lead in basically everybody's water. All of us have lead in our water. So I think what you see is that historically we've had a kind of, trickle-down approach to environmentalism that's cleaned up environmental problems where and when affluent Americans encounter them most. And I think what we're seeing now and been stashing 
you know, the toxics and the waste and the everything else in low income communities. And I think what we're seeing now is a tipping point, right? It's sort of like a flood, right? It fills all the low lying areas and then it just spills over to everywhere. And I think that's what we're seeing now is that now affluent folks are not going to be, I mean, they're certainly going to be able to avoid these problems more than than other folks, but you know these problems are are basically knocking on everyone's back doors at this point, even though they're still far, far, far more devastating, and in communities of color especially. Um, you, so you I would argue, like, things? let's stop with this heroic, you know, here's the Cuyahoga River when it was on fire, and now it's not on fire, but our waters are in terrible shape. Just so clearly, the the regulation that we have, you know allowed us to do marginal improvements, but not, not it, it, because again, they, it didn't actually address the root causes, which is sort of economic, you know, structural, structurally with the kinds of market, with what our economy, the engine of our society is actually designed to do, um, which is inherently to ignore environmental and social costs, um, you know, ultimately cool. caught up with us. I mean, I would, I, I, I'm not talking about, the triumph of environmentalism. I'm, I, I, I mean, I, I'm more talking about the triumph of capitalism and technology. If going back to the industrial revolution, I mean, it, the point is, yes, absolutely, it's inequitable. It's designed to be inequitable. But we've gone from having cholera in every pump handle to to not. I mean, we the the water quality, you know, you know, definitely got worse in China after they started manufacturing stuff there, but now it's getting rapidly better. And, and the, you know, the quality of life and the, the length of life in China has, has just gone up considerably. So there's, so there's this way in which it's, you know, it seems, it seems like um, the, the basic engine does, does make things better um not at the right pace and not equitably at all uh mm -hmm. although although that remains to be seen like with climate change is, is kind yeah. of the thing that could uh could completely break it you know and could mm -hmm. could uh, prove that prove the ultimate exception to that rule i mean i'm not sure i mean i think it depends on how you measure quality of life i think it depends on if you ask whose quality of life is better are people who live in um, Cancer Alley, you know, the 80 mile strip between New Orleans and um, Baton Rouge with, where they have 150 petrochemical plants. And in some of these parishes, the cancer rate is 50 times the national average. Do they think that their quality of life is better, you know, than 50 years ago before they had all these petrochemical plants there? So I think, you know, again, we really have to ask the who questions and what is actually responsible? Is it capitalism, which again is a word I completely avoid in my book because I think it just makes things, it, it makes it really hard to clearly talk about um, economy because, you know, or is it public policy? Is, is it public, um, was it public um, funds that went into, you know, eradicating cholera? Is it, you know, it's very, um, is it public subsidies? Is it our tax money? Is it, you know, how much of it was like, you know, the accumulation of private profit, which I don't, think, you know, I mean, I think it's really hard to, so I don't use the word capitalism because um, I, I just kind of made that decision early on because first of all, I didn't want to lose 85, 95% of my readers on the first page, you know, either from left or right, you know, from left, it's like, oh, we've heard this, you know, and from the right, like, oh, well, she's critiquing capitalism because they're going to bring all these, oh, capitalism, that's democracy, freedom, which I don't think capitalism has anything to do with. And then from the left, it's like, oh, well, we know this critique. So instead, I'm just talking about, I think there's too much baggage. I think we should just get rid of the words capitalism, socialism for a year, along with like the whole earth icon, get rid of that too, just for a year, just to give us some breathing space, just to be able to talk clearly about our problems and um, just talk about you know, if you just say, if instead you stop talking about capitalism versus socialism and you instead ask, what do you think our economy should do and whom do you think our economy should be for? I think there's a much bigger area of agreement. There's a much larger Venn diagram there between left and right. And that, you know, most of us won't think that our economy should work for everyone and that our economy should give us the resources we need to thrive and that our economy should not be inherently devastating you know, and create a world now where, 
well, I won't go into it because that's, that's really not, I mean, that is the point of the book, but um, I don't want to get into um, talking mostly about economics, but, but um, well, I think, so, so I think, I, I think, you know, I just decided to jettison the word capitalism because I think it just, a lot of people don't even quite, I mean, it's what we have now, really capitalism seems more more to me like sort of subsidized oligarchy, right? you know, and, and so many of the, so much of what we had, say, even when I was young in the 1960s and 1970s, it wasn't really capitalism that was creating that. It was sort of all of the public policies that were, you know, it was the social net. It was, it was major public funding for the things that we needed. So it just makes it really, really hard to, to talk. Oh, we have a lot of questions apparently. Okay. Yeah. So just but before we get to that, sure. um, just what about the, I mean, we've talked so far about the first half of the book and this, the second yeah. half, you know, if the, if the first half is stop, the second uh -huh. half is start, right? right? So, so maybe you could just you could just say a word about what sure. what should people do if they yeah. shouldn't be saving the planet? Yeah, no, I really appreciate you asking that because this is all critique, and people might be saying, "Oh, but well, what do I do? What do I do?" So, um, first of all, full disclosure. I'm not telling you how to fix our economy. I'm not telling you how to create the technology we need. I'm not telling you exactly how to fix agriculture or energy systems or you know our tax system or anything like that. Um, I'm sort of not the person to do that. I, I read you know, like everybody else does. So what I've done is to do almost like a parody, but also kind of sincere um, um, riff on the, on the standard listicle, you know, 10 easy things you can do to stop climate change from your kitchen, right? And I've done 39 ways to stop saving the planet, which are things like, it's not so much that you shouldn't do anything, but it's like, what exactly should you do? So a lot of the things are um, social change instead of individual change, you know, join, you can join groups, you can band together with your neighbors to do all kinds of things or with other people in your city. Some of it is um, figure out where the worst messes are, where you live. Because, you know, doing things to stop climate change in your house in Beverly Hills is not, is not gonna do a thing, right? So what, what you need to do is figure out where the worst mess is and who's working to clean those up. And it's going to invariably be in low income areas and in communities of color. Because if we focus on the worst messes, that's the fastest way to clean up these. And then some of them are um, um, uh, about consumption, just because green consumerism is so insane right now. Uh, runaway green consumerism. It's about um, how to consume. It's about um, a really important ones about how to move wealth around. So pay more attention to how you create wealth than to how you use it to buy things or to how you use it to give away. I think that's enormously important, especially for young people, those who do have options, you know, uh, in terms of the careers they choose. Um, and then and then there's a whole bunch of that are really just sort of like ways of knowing, ways of thinking. So it's there's a bunch of suggestions for things to read and watch and, and listen to. There's a bunch of... Um, there's a bunch of redefine environment, redefine economy, redefine ambitious, redefine efficiency, redefine costs. Um, and then there's like tell a frickin' joke, right? Because <laughs> environmentalism is so righteous and pious and it needs to really embrace irony and humor, I think, as really powerful tools. And um, it's like, um, you know, creative is as creative does, art is enormously important. I have one called Steams which makes a particular plug for the humanities in an era when we're seeing a, a dangerous, dangerous decline of the humanities. And, and I guarantee you, we will not be able to beat that climate change if, if we don't keep humanities as a strong component in education. So, so that, that's basically what, um, hopefully they're fun. Norton did a great job designing that part of the book, I think, I'm, I really like it. And, um, then there's some scribble zones where you can write your own ideas. Is that what you're asking, Nate? Yeah. Um, yeah, why don't we go to some questions from people sure. who are tuning in. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> I'm back. Great conversation. Um, yeah, should... really great conversation. Um, I'm Throughout the entire conversation, I'm wondering, oh, God, I'm just doing everything wrong, aren't I? Like, <laughs> um, so, which is why my question uh, to get everyone kind of jumped first. Um, so clearly, I'm doing everything wrong. Um, probably everything except yeah. literally wearing my clothes until they are rags uh, might be the only thing that I might be doing right. Um, and then using them as rags after that. Um, but who is actually doing things right? 
So we have so many examples of people doing things wrong. Is anyone doing anything mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. No, that's a really good question. And I would also say that, yeah, we're all doing things things wrong. And just to alert you that I am having a little trouble with your video. So, uh-oh, now I've lost all of us. Can you hear me? We can still hear you. Yeah. Am I coming through? Uh, your video is... You having trouble your sound is connecting. fine, but your video is a little... Yeah, uh, okay, now you're back. Um, okay. Um, so, um, you know, one thing I would say is just that I argue that in, as an individual, you can't save the planet. Um, you're not to blame, you know, unless you're the CEO of Exxon, you know, um, or someone like that. You're not to blame either. I mean, you're not the one who created the plastic bottles. Um, and, you know, companies have been incredibly good at branding that as a consumer waste problem instead of a producing toxic crap problem, which is what it really is. So. So, but what can you do? I actually have, you know, I thought someone might ask me that. So I'm going to read <laughs> a list that I have in here in the 39 ways. It says stock up on, it's the 12th way to stop saving the planet. It says stock up on, yes, it's possible. It's happening as we speak models. Um, single use, and these are both in, uh, I'm not going to read where they are, which I do uh, include, but these are both in the U.S. and out, out of, um, Single-use plastic spans, worker co-ops, worker ownership, citywide green infrastructure, regenerative agriculture, affordable health care for all, everybody but us, green chemistry, 32-hour work week, four-week vacation policies, bans on toxics and cosmetics and cleaners, bans on ultra-toxic pesticides, only glass beverage bottles allowed with a near 100% return rate, 95% food waste recycling, right to repair laws, sustainable stormwater management, public banking, land trusts, and well-being versus GDP as economic health index. So you can get started with those, Shane. Um, no, but all those, you know, there's there's this sense of, oh my God, but you know, the solutions are out there and the literature, I mean, people have been talking about degrowth economies and how to, you know, doing this economic critique for decades, for, I don't know, a hundred years or something. And um, there's a huge literature. There's tons of people out there doing wonderful, wonderful things to not save the planet. And um, it's not like, this is not mysterious. You know, this is not magic. Um, I actually don't think it's that hard. It just requires the political will, I think. I think that's the other, the other thing, I mean, that's a big focus of what we do at risk now is solutions. So mm -hmm. trying to find things that are solutions or opposed to solutions and mm -hmm. and writing about them in depth and, and writing about them critically too and finding right. where they go part way or don't work. And, um, and you know, one of the big challenges, they, you know, so we do things like, you know, looking at at uh, forms of agriculture that that work um, and you know fit right in into the uh, into the model that we have in the United States. You know, these conservative guys in Indiana, but you, you know, I've been I've been writing about this forever. But they always, no matter what they do, they're still filling up their uh, streams with mm -hmm. nitrogen. And so here's this yeah. place where they actually. Mm -hmm. reduced it a little bit and and it comes down to often politics so in this case it was it was it's it's just like getting everybody on board and so i find more and more it comes down to sort of where you left off like the political will like okay yes it just comes down to political will how do you build that you know right what what things are politically possible um and what's what's yeah. politically bridged too far how do you choose those yeah, and also, economic, I'm sorry, I'm, you guys are really breaking up, so I'm going to just keep going. Um, I've lost both of you. Mm, now I've lost my video. But, um, and also economically possible, right? We have to make it economically possible for people to, for, for independent bookstores, right, to thrive. Um, so this must be my internet, um, but I'm having trouble since Shane came back in. Um, but um, and, and I would say that that one of the main things that people can do is, is to be knowledgeable, is to be knowledgeable. Right. So um, and Grist is one of the best places you can go, in my opinion. And I think it's been really interesting um, to watch Grist evolve, actually, from the time that I've always been a Grist fan. When, when did Grist start? It's been what, about 20 years or something? Yeah, um, um, 2000 and uh, gosh, I should know this exactly. But yeah, it's it's about 20, 20 years old, I think. It was one of the first yeah. online only 
publications. Yeah, I mean, it seems like to me like it's really evolved in, in the exact direction we're talking about to focus a lot more on justice, on economy. You know, it seemed to me it started out more as a kind of like, hey, we can all change our light bulbs kind of approach. But um, absolutely, yeah. I think I think that's true, and just sort of like, you know, what I don't know if it started out this way, but after mm -hmm. a while, it sort of became like we're just going to write about things that the greenies like. You know, we're, it doesn't matter necessarily. We won't look too hard at mm -hmm. whether it's uh, um, actually good for the environment or not, but, you know, just this cultural uh, institution. And I think mm -hmm. we've we've come away from that and say, wait a second, that's, if we do that, we're just really kind of only talking to those few people. So let's try and yeah. talk to, to everybody, mm -hmm. and especially the people who are hurt most by, by this, let's mm -hmm. talk not just for them, but but to them. Um, yeah. So yeah, definitely uh, solutions and and justice. That's, that's where it's yeah. at. Yeah, I, I really think uh, grist and story of stuff is another place I really really love. If folks are looking for, you know, um, sources for for good 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 information. Yeah, I know we have a good. lot of questions. So stuff. Yeah. We do, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, that was just the answer to my question. Uh, but let's go to Susan. So Susan, I, I think maybe we could get your input, uh, both of you. If you could design U.S. policy for reaching net zero, what would that look like? <laughs> uh, you know, again, I'm not like the economist who's going to tell you exactly step by step how to do that. The one thing I will say is that if you want to tackle our environmental issues, you have to tackle economy. What they say in 1992 is the economy stupid. That 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 dates me, but that was the that was I think what John Kerry's. Um, no, it was Bill Clinton's. It was Bill mean? Clinton's. You know, and I feel like if the Democrats had taken that seriously, um, I just said this somewhere. But if the Democrats had had really seriously taken that, it's the economy stupid. They could have saved us a lot of agony over the last 30 years and a lot of agony in the future. But um, you have to deal. You you cannot have an economy that mac that where the purpose is to maximize profits and growth at the expense of people and environments. It's just not going to be possible. You can tinker all you want, but um, green growth is, is a fantasy. Yeah. Uh, Jonah's question, how do we address racial and economic dis discrepancies in environmental impact? Um, well, I can take that. I, I, I'm sure I think uh, Nate has written a lot about this, but um, yeah, I mean, we, we have to absolutely. I mean, I think one of the problems is that we, we haven't, you know, we've had this kind of just do anything anywhere approach, right? Which doesn't focus on where the worst messes are. You know, I have this, I think the last reason in my book is called to, um, to tackle the ways in which we are all in this together. You have to tackle the ways in which we are not all in this together. The fastest way to clean up environmental problems is to go after the inequalities and to start actually focusing on places like Cancer Alley in Southeast LA and um, South Albuquerque and North St. Louis and um, you know which the, it's the south side of Chicago and um, you know everybody every city has this area that's just devastated. So I think um, I think that's um, I, I think that. Obviously, there's a huge racial component to inequities, but I think they're they're foundationally environmental as well. That inequities, you know, I really think that the way you define economy, not how you'll see it in the dictionary, but it's how we change environments to provide our needs and wants, and how we distribute the benefits and the costs. So I talk about the Green New Deal a little bit differently. Most people are kind of like, well, we can use one crisis to solve another crisis. We can use green jobs to solve, um, you know, the massive um, um, income gaps. And I say, no, 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 that's really not the way to think about it. The way we have to think about it is that our economy is foundationally environmental. And so the definition of democracy is basically how we change environments sustainably and equitably. So that's kind of an abstract um, answer, but um, that's what I would say, like focus on the worst messes, focus on the worst messes. Environmental justice needs to be equally about environment and justice, I think. Uh, Sue's question, and I think the answer beyond re read this book. Um, so what advice would you give the Biden administration as to the climate and initiatives they're about to roll out? Do you have like maybe one of the 
like topics that you like one of the things that you talk about that you would most like for them to be like you're doing this wrong like <laughs> Um, and I would love for actually, I, I'll, I'll give a short answer. I would love for Nate to, to weigh in because I know you write about this stuff in detail, Nate, but like great going, think bigger, think much, much bigger. And, and you have to tackle the root causes again. You know, I'm just going to be, be a parrot here and repeat myself. You, you can't, um, you can't just treat the symptoms. You know, we're going to finally have to stop pretending that this economy is going to work. And, and that it can work for all of us. So, um, you know, great going, think bigger. You can't replace a billion cars with a jillion cars. It's not gonna, it's not gonna beat back climate change. And climate change isn't the only existential problem we have. We're basically destroying with toxics, we're destroying the ecosystems, you know, and the diversity that we, that we depend on to live. Um, so think bigger, think bigger and, and, and move away from green growth. It's not gonna work and be a world leader in doing that. Um, Nate, I'm going to, I'm going to pass that football to you. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I, I disagree that green growth can't work. Um, I'm, I'm definitely not a degrowther. I think there's some real equity problems uh, in degrowth. Um, and there's, I, you know, I, I see the math working in, in green growth. If you can, if you really can get into the energy transition. Um, the, um, but I think, I think my advice for the Biden administration would just be, I mean, and maybe, maybe this is the difference between us is it's just like, mm -hmm. I, 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 I was born at a time where I just have not seen anybody get anything done on the environment. Like I just, I so badly want, um, any kind of change from the status quo. I, 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 so I, I, I would say um, if there's a window, let's not repeat Waxman Markey. I, I'd, ra I'd rather have a win um, and, and then, then say like, no, we need to think much bigger if that, if that imperils the window and we have to wait another 10 years. I would argue that because we didn't think big, we lost the opportunity for 10 years, right? I mean, it's really important to remember that a lot of people that stormed the Capitol voted for Obama twice, right? But, you know, and it's the same thing like environmentalism for decades hasn't significantly helped so many people who live in low income communities. So we've lost that public support too, right? We've lost that public support. That's the other thing I would say. I mean, if you really want public support for environmentalism, Stop consciousness raising, you know, whatever. Stop trying to explain to people how, uh, you know, climate change is going to just, you know, destroy all of us. And, you know, Miami's going to sink into the earth and improve people's lives. Pursue economic policies that actually improve people's lives. And then I think they will. And that's what we're seeing already in such a short time with Biden's go big policies is that they're actually have a lot of broad support among um, Republicans as well. So, um yeah, I think I think going small got us Trump, you know, and I would say I would say that that's what we're seeing with Biden going big is they're they're saying going small back then got us Trump. So no, I, I agree with that. I just I, the, um, mm -hmm. I would just say that, you know, if improving everybody's lives, especially the, the Biden way, you know, it's a lot of concrete. It's a, it's a lot of growth. It's a, you know, that's that's all those incomes going up and I'd love to, I'd love to draw the richest incomes down to match, but uh, right. um, I'd also be perfectly happy to just cleanly generate the, the uh, energy so that we can have that growth without, a, without hurting the environment. Yeah. I'm not sure you can do that, but I think we've, that's what we've been trying to do. Anyway, we're, we've had that conversation. Let's take another, yeah, another, another um, well, a comment from Michael. I love the idea the idea of banishing isms for a year. And um, Kelly has a comment that kind of touches on something discussed earlier as well. Uh, Jenny, you mentioned the decline in the humanities being problematic to meaningful change. I assume you talk about it in your book, but could you say a little bit more about that here? Yeah, I think it's really, really dangerous. And I do. I actually have a, something I call steam which adds um, 
humanities to STEAM because STEM became STEAM with arts, which I think was a huge insult to the humanities. <laughs> that we added arts and not humanities. So yeah, I mean, um, I think it's Okay, I think we did actually possibly lose Jenny. Um, okay, yep. Uh, so maybe Jenny will come back uh, quickly. Um, I guess, uh, did you have an answer? Oh, oh there you are. Are you back, Jenny? Yeah, the what? Okay. All right, we lost you for a minute. Yeah, I lost you too. I was hoping you didn't lose me, so I kept going. But um, so, yeah, so humanities, I mean, just think about it. I mean, like, um, humanities are about, you know, why people do what they do and think what they think, right? So climate change isn't just about science, right? I mean, scientists by themselves can't solve any problem in the United States, right, or in the world. They just do the science, right? So we need to understand, for example, why do people um, hate environmentalists? when environmentalists are the ones who are saying, we want your kids to breathe clean air. Well, that's that's a question that you need history to understand. That's a question that you need to understand how people think and how people understand the world and how people think in stories, right? And how people use language and how politicians use language and how Fox News use language, uses language, right? Um, and um, humanities, I think, are particularly good at sort of complicated why um, questions. And um, it's, uh, you, you know, it's narrative analysis, it's critical thinking, it's it's understanding. Um, I, I don't think, I think it's enormously um, dangerous that, um, that, that, that education from K through, through, through university is, is setting, is really, you know, celebrating STEM and setting the humanities aside and, and arts as well. But um, I think it's incredibly dangerous and um, yeah. I have a project I do called Steam, which is like this Yiddishy rant in defense of the humanities sort of this performance. One of these days I'll put it on YouTube. So right. um, one last question. Probably people in the audience who can answer that question better. Yeah. Uh, final question from Linda. Who specific people or in general do you hope most do you most hope reads your book? Specific people like you know, I mean, I can tell you that the two audiences that I have mostly in mind are, it's not environmental justice folks who I think there's a lot of, most of what's in the book won't surprise them, though I hope they'll read it and find it useful. But um, it's well-intentioned environmentalists and the audience I care most about is young people. Because I think, unfortunately, young people are the ones who are gonna be left with these problems. Uh, young people are the people I love most in this world. Um, and, um, and I think that, that millennials and, and younger have, in general, my experience has been that they're more flexible about thinking about environment and economy, which I think is going to be absolutely necessary to solving the problem. So, um, I know it's a bit presumptuous for someone my age to write for young people, but, um, I forced my nephews to read it, uh, and to, to tell me where I was doing okay boomer stuff. Um, so hopefully, hopefully, uh, I'm hoping to reach um, to reach young folks. Yeah, I mean, I would love for um, Joe Biden to read it. I'd love for AOC to read it. You know, I'd love for people in power to read it. Um, so if any of you are out there, please, please read it. <laughs> yes, and order the copy from Left Bank Books uh, because Books. you know I'll sign it for Joe Biden. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yep. I actually dropped it by Cory Bush's office, but um, I never heard from them. So, yeah, I rode my bike up there, dropped it off. Nobody was there because it's COVID. I think everybody's working at home. But yeah. yeah, she's actually my representative, which is totally cool. Yeah, very proud of that. Like that is like big thing for Missouri. Like we get that at least. Yeah, I'm uh, represented by Josh Hawley and Corey Bush. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, I don't want to end. On, I don't want to end on that note. But, uh, Thank you so much for this incredible conversation. Um, reminder, I did put a link uh, for Nathaniel, your newest book um, is in the comments as well, but Stop Saving the Planet, available from Left Bank Books. Jenny will come by and she's already signed copies. So if you just want to sign copy, we have those on the shelf uh, that we can have available for pickup immediately. 
or for mail out anywhere in the country, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, whatever. Um, so if you do want to order a copy, have it sent to one of your friends, uh, it is available immediately. If you want to get it personalized, just leave a note in the order and Jenny will stop by soon to personalize copies. So those will be available for you. Uh, just make sure to say, I want a personalized copy and we will be happy to do that for you. Uh, Nathaniel, thank you so much for the work that you do for the conversation uh, that we have this evening. Uh, Jenny, thank you for writing this book and for uh, supporting the cause. Thanks so much, Jenny. Thanks, Shane. And to the audience, have a great evening and we will see you again soon. Thanks,